All right, you guys, it's Elevated here, coming at you finally um, with the start of my series called Cope. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a whole series because I couldn't do this all in one video. Um, but yeah, it's uh, the denial of death or why everything is a cult. Um, <clears throat> so this has been like a monumental task for me. It's taken so long because it's basically like... So you have the um, the YouTubers who do movie reacts where they'll go through scene by scene and like record themselves reacting to the movie and like comment commenting on it here and there and whatnot. Basically, that's what I'm going to be doing. But instead of a movie, I'm going to be doing it with this book, The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's about as boring as it sounds, but it's <laughs> there's a lot of really, really like profound things in this book that we really do need to touch upon. Um, it's it's. it's it's going to be taking a lot of the things that I've learned pretty much throughout my whole life. Um, it's going to be, it's going to require me to mention a lot of the things that I've been um, talking about on my channel so far. Um, so this really is like a culmination of like everything I've learned in life up until this point, pretty much. Um, that's... Part of the reason why it's taken me so long, another part of the reason is because I decided to make it really hard on myself and completely reorganize everything. So instead of going through the book in order, I've like um, separated and recategorized everything into different chapters. Um, so this video is just going to be the preface, um, and then as you'll see, the next videos are going to be the different uh, chapters that we have. So why we cope. Um, it's going to be talking about man's duality, um, staring into the face of death and life and why it's so hard for us. And like pretty much if, if you haven't like started this process yet, this one's going to be like probably the hardest to watch. Um, just cause you are going to have to deal with a lot of, um, or like face up to a lot of like the realities about life and death, um, as we go through that. And then it's also going to um, touch upon heroism, which is the initial cope. Um, part two, the copes. This one's probably going to be like the longest section. I'm probably going to have to separate this one into two videos at least. Just because it really is just like breaking down a vast majority of uh, human behavior. And why they're all copes and uh, how, how that applies. So yeah, the transference, the sexual slash romantic copes and neurotic copes and then different uh, stuff like that. Part three is going to be, um, I would say, the most important part. Uh, modern problems require ancient solutions. So the modern problems um, would be, like, why copes are failing nowadays. And we're going to touch upon that later in this video. Um, and then we're going to talk about, like, auto Rank's artistic solution, which um, a lot of people don't really talk about Otto Rank. He's one of the um, lesser known people. Like, people talk about young... Freud, uh, Adler, um, and people like that, but Otto Rank was another person in that, in that group who, um, he's a lot less well-known, um, but he's got a really good, um, breakdown of, like, the artistic solution, um, that he has, and then we're also going to be looking at Kierkegaard's religious solution, and kind of, like, um, merging those two together, um, so yeah, that's the table of contents. That's pretty much what we're going to be looking forward to. Like I said, this might take me the rest of the year. Hopefully I can get this all done in November now that I've got like everything um, laid out like this. I still have like one or two more chapters to write everything down, but um, I think mostly everything is going to be in part two and part three, so I should be able to get part one out pretty fast. But yeah, that's what you have looking forward um, so starting with this, I'm going to do my own preface, and then we're going to look at the author's preface. Um, so everything in moderation, of course. <laughs> it's kind of like an underlying thing that's been going through, like, all of my videos. Um, the best example I can bring up, um, is when he talks about Freud. Excuse me, and his, um, um, 
sexual theory, the Oedipus complex. Basically, Freud has uh, uh, the idea that um, all of human um, action and desire and um, will stems from uh, the sexual urge. And um, it's funny because Ernest Becker like points that out and says like, hey, you sh- it's like you shouldn't be. Yeah, you know, take everything in moderation. You shouldn't be saying, you know, definitively, this is the <laughs> base, like, <laughs> urge for everything. But then he goes back and does the same thing and says, well, the fear of death is the base, like, motivating factor in all of human behavior. And so it's, like, it's... <laughs> just remember, like, everything in moderation. Like, always, like, take a balance whenever he says something. Like, oh, um, this is the way it is and not any other way. Like, just remember to moderate that statement in your head. Like, I'm going to be trying to, like, catch all of them as I go through. But, like, uh, it's <laughs> it's it's something that you have to learn how to do as well. But, yeah. Um, another thing to point out, the author's biases. He's a cultural anthrop- anthropologist. Um, so, he's going to be talking about, like, religion um, from a very secular standpoint. Um, more so as, like, instead of, like, it being something, like, like, true or, like, possible, he talks about it more as, like, being, like, a, um, a necessary illusion or, like, just a, a, a tool in, 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 in some way. Um, this was also written in the 70s, so, like, he mentioned stuff like schizophrenia, and I haven't really, like, looked up too much into it, but I'm pretty sure, like, how we understand schizophrenia nowadays is a lot different than what we understood about it in the 70s. So, like, there might be some inaccurate information in there, but, like, the the stuff that he's referring to, even though it might not be schizophrenia, like, it's still referring to actual, like, um, other conditions that still, like, pretty much leaves his underlying theory intact. But, yeah. Um... Just remembering all of those biases, keeping that in mind. The illusion of choice and the trap of duality. The illusion of choice, I would say, is like, um, he, he, Becker will say stuff like, um, man either has the choice to, like, live under a fantasy illusion or be paralyzed by the fear of reality. And it's like, he, he only presents those two options and it, it, as if those were the only options. So being aware of the illusion of choice. Um, this also comes from like art of war type thinking where it's like if an opponent gives you. Uh, or yeah, if an opponent gives you two options, you're not supposed to take either of them. Because <laughs> usually both of them lead to his benefit. And uh, if he like plans it right, the one that. um looks like the more logical rational choice for you to pick from your perspective usually ends up being the worst choice um so yeah just being aware of that and then the trap of duality um just thinking um just being aware of like that i yes no true false um being caught in that like um what was i gonna say about that um like just I I think there's an an example later on as we read but like just being aware of like not falling for that um duality of thinking like right or wrong yes or no uh stuff like that um spirituality and the gold shackled karmic heaven uh <laughs> you'll have to go and watch my Jainism 102 video to um really touch upon like everything that uh or this whole idea i should say um but basically so there is this idea in jainism and i guess kind of sort of buddhism and hinduism as well where it's like uh karma is interpreted as like intention or desire and while they're they do make a distinction between like good karma and bad karma um basically like if you're still 
like a, a desiring for a heaven or like doing good to go to this karmic heaven like it's it's not the same as the liberation that they were that they talk about being liberated from this karmic cycle um and the only reason why like i bring that up is because like as i go through like different religions like the when you really get into christianity and not just like the uh bible belt like um <laughs> um Joel Osteen church mega church like interpretations of it like the actual like teachings of like Jesus and the Bible pretty much coincide with um the teachings of like Jainism and Buddhism of like non-attachment and um letting go and we we looked at all that um in like conflict in that video over conflict in uh the other video that i can't think of oh being in the world not of the world and so we kind of like looked and compared those eastern and western um thoughts but yeah um so just being aware of that um basically um the urge toward more life again when we talk about karma we talk about like intention and desire and um stuff like that so the urge toward more life um is basically what keeps you trapped on this uh, karmic cycle um and looking at the trap of duality again um the urge towards more life on the flip side is also the fear of death the fear of like um annihilation or obliteration um and they're both uh, um pretty much like um i know i said everything in moderation earlier but this this like urge this desire um I would say is probably like the base motivating factor of like a lot of like not even just like human behavior but like life all of life in general like this urge to like promulgate and propagate and um continue living is what's really like that's that's what karma is I would say Ugh, I don't know about that but anyways um <clears throat> as far as like false gods go and this urge towards more life. Um, how would I explain this one? Um, so false gods would be anything that try to promise you, like, um, immortality on some level. Or some level of, like, protection. Um, so we'll read this real quick. The famous Bhagavad Gita addresses a contradiction between duty to society and duty to one's own soul. The Bhagavad Gita suggests that this contradiction can be resolved when one is aware that any form of disciplined action taken without regard for personal benefit is a service to the gods. Um, so basically, when we're talking about, like, the gods, uh, what we mean is, like, probably, like, egregores. Um, I think I talked about that in my American Gods video. Um, and you can, like, it, it really doesn't matter. Uh, this is the driving point that I want to bring down about this stuff is like it really doesn't matter if you look at it from a secular perspective as just being like oh it's just human behavior and social dynamics producing macro patterns of of um sociological behavior basically um or if you want to look at it um from a religious or spiritual perspective as oh these are these these macro patterns are actually like beings in some sense and they have like like they interact with the world and in, in or they re their reflection interacts with the world in some way like it it either way like it really doesn't matter what perspective you view it from like because like the phenomenon is still there like the actual like 
the the force of like a group dynamic like in any group like you always like there's this um urge to conform um that um it's like a force that um is present and if you're not aware of it um or if you um so like for example if you're doing um any form of disciplined action that can be taken as um ritualistic any form of ritual um taken without regard for personal benefit i would say re- without regard for personal spiritual benefit is a service to the gods so if you're if you're um let's say football you watch football every sunday monday or whatever days they come on um you do this ritual of like okay get the tv on get the popcorn or food or whatever you have the beer and stuff like that grill um sit on the couch and watch the game like that's that's ritualistic behavior it's disciplined action taken without regard for personal benefit now it it, it is like personal benefit this is why i say spiritual benefit because like it is personal benefit on like a creature comfort level um like you get that like camaraderie and stuff like that but like if if it if it gives you no like personal spiritual benefit it's a service to the gods is basically what this is saying um so if you're if you're like if you if you haven't overcome this fear of death and you you're still feeling this urge this desire towards more life and you continue to do ritualistic action without regard for personal spiritual benefit like you're you're servicing gods basically um and whether you want to believe that as being like a secular perspective just macro patterns of human behavior or you actually want to believe like the religious and spiritual like these are deities on some on some sense like it 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 doesn't matter like it's still the same thing the same effect is still happening um so yeah that's that's the preface i wanted to touch upon all that i think that's it on that um key terms uh or glossary that we'll have to go through before we get into this book um the oedipal complex versus the oedipal project um, so the Oedipal Complex is um, Freud's theory about, um, well, the Oedipal story is Oedipus is fated to kill his father, marry his mother. Um, Freud says that, like, the um, sexual urge is, like, one of the first and, like, foundational urges to, like... Um, the mother is seen as like an object to wed and the father is a competitor that you must uh, overcome or vanquish um however society doesn't allow you to do that <laughs> uh so like um all of these feelings are repressed in some way and that's what causes this complex according to freud's theory um whereas the oedipal project um, I believe this was Rank's theory, is um, more about, like, um, it's not taken as, like, a sexual, on a sexual level, it's more about, like, um, being able to overcome the the shadow of the parents in the way that, like, when you're first born into this world, they're seen as, like, deities almost from your perspective, like, these beings that have mastered like this this life or whatever if if you had like good parents or whatnot um but like um the Oedipal project is basically like um just trying to stand on one's own two feet i would say pretty sure yeah um causa sui or Kazasui, however you want to say that. I think I think that's a Schopenhauer term. Um, it basically means self-generated. Um, so it's it, uh, the way Becker talks about it throughout this book. He talks about it like it's um, this lie that we try to tell ourselves that we are self-generated because we can't face up to um, the truth of being like animalistic and like being made of flesh that eventually. Um, 
faded to decay and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, this causa sui like is it kind of ties in with the Uedible project where it's basically like you're trying to both of these together, like you're trying to forge like in an immortality a form of immortality for yourself. Whether you um use the Uedible project um to go like attach yourself to like an ideal or like a nation or something like that. Um or um it's like you're 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 trying to find a way to like earn your right to mortality basically with with these two with these two things um transference is where um so the best way i can describe it is let's say you had like really bad parents and like they they scarred you traumatized you whatnot and you're trying to overcome that um you, transference is where like you you place the entire like um focal point of like what is wrong with life like everything that's evil in the world on the on those parents that traumatized you and it's like your your immortality um project is basically like you trying to overcome the, your parents like vanquishing your parents in some way um um so that would be that transference is is whenever like you take the the evil that's present like in the entire like reality and like focus it down onto one figure or one symbol such as the parents in that situation and then um later on when you go to therapy and you're trying to um overcome that what happens is um that that transference of power of like that transference of focus um transfers over to the therapist in the in the sense that like how should i say this um like you all of a sudden when when in in the first example like the dynamic was your parents were was the evil in the world and you had to overcome it when you go to the therapist all of a sudden the therapist represents uh, you know like health and vitality and stability and stuff like that and you're trying to gain that from him like in both cases what you're doing is like giving this like power to something external to draw back into yourself whereas like you can just <laughs> skip that process and not transfer any sort of like power or whatnot to either either positive like in the therapist's case or negative in the parent's case um but yeah that's <laughs> we'll go more in depth than that again this is just going over these key terms um let's see this one as well escalation of commitment hazing and cults so as we go through like all these different copes um you should really be aware of of these dynamics that are uh, that happen um so being anyone being told that like the way they're living their life is a lie or something like that they're gonna react negatively um um, but yeah, so like, um, we'll just read this. Persons who go through a great deal of trouble or pain to attain something tend to value it more highly than persons who attain the same thing with a minimum of effort. And everyone struggles with life. Everyone like goes through, um, a great deal of trouble or pain to attain whatever footing they have, um, on like whatever, from whatever, um, power source they can um glean from um so no matter what like you're going to you're going to value the way you're living your life even if it hasn't like led you far or like done much for you you're going to value it because you worked for it basically even if it's not working for you um 
Hazing can cause social cohesion through group identification and identity fusion. A 2017 study published in Scientific Reports found that groups that share painful or strong negative experiences can cause visceral visceral bonding and pro-group behavior. Um... So, like, again, like, just going through any sort of, like, struggle, and this is, like, when we're talking about this, like, people talk about, like, hazing and cults, but, like, this happens even on, like, a minor level uh, with, like, jobs, with um, social groups, with um, any any sort of, like, interaction between people. This, this can, this um, process can be a factor, um, but yeah. Dissonance can produce feelings of group attraction or social identity among initiates after the hazing experience because they want to justify the effort used. This is another thing where it's like, even if something's not working out for you, like, it's very hard to be like, okay, I made a mistake. Like, so what you do is like that, that uh, mental gymnastics where you're just like, you're trying to justify it as being like, oh, I can, it, um, it, it'll it work for me eventually like the thing that comes to mind now is like gambling addicts where they're like um they're just addicted to keep on going because it's like they have this th- this justification in their mind where it's like oh if i can just get one big hit like if i can just get one big one big um jackpot like that they they wanted that that would justify all of the all of the losses they've made throughout the years but yeah um Rewards during initiations or hazing rituals matter in that initiates who feel more rewarded express stronger group identity. Um, yeah. Um, so any any time you're rewarded for being like interacting in a in a group, it's it's this process is biasing your um your perception of it. Um, as well as increasing group attraction, hazing can produce conformity among new members. Hazing could also increase feelings of affiliation because of the stressful nature of the hazing experience. Um, yeah, um, being sh- struggling through with other people is a very like powerful bonding experience. So, being like struggling through like, a a very, like, I'm just thinking, like, bad jobs where, like, you're short-staffed, and the people who are there are, like, barely hanging on, but, like, it's, you, you become closer, like, naturally, um, and these are just, um, natural things, uh, natural processes that you should be aware of, again, as we go through and break down all of these copes, like, be aware that you probably will be reacting in this way, um, where you're, like, going to be biased towards like well everyone wants to think they're living life the right way um so owning up to like mistakes or like being aware that you are making a mistake is is well it's hard (laughs) That's, that's all i can say but yeah that that pretty much sums up my preface now we're gonna go through the author's preface and It's going to be, like, the actual author's preface, and then I think there's, like, a couple of, like, one or two paragraphs that are pulled randomly from, like, different sections here. Like, different sections, so we can actually, like, touch upon all of these in this preface. So, yeah. Um, The prospect of death, Dr. Johnson said, wonderfully concentrates the minds. The main thesis of this book is that it does much more than that. The idea of death, the fear of it, haunts the human animal like nothing else. It is a mainspring of human activity. Activity designed largely to avoid the fatality of death, to overcome it by denying in some way, read Cope, that it is the final destiny for man. The noted anthropologist A.M. Hogarth once argued that primitive, sorry, primitives were not bothered by the fear of death, that a sagacious sampling of anthropological evidence would show that death was more often than not accompanied by rejoicing and festivities that death seemed to be an occasion for celebration rather than fear much like the traditional irish wink 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 um hokart wanted to dispel the notion that compared to modern man primitives were childish and frightened by reality 
anthropologists have now largely accomplished this rehabilitation of the primitive. But this argument leaves untouched the fact that the fear of death is indeed a universal in human condition. To be sure, primitives often celebrate death, as Hokart and others have shown, because they believe that death is the ultimate promotion, the final ritual elevation to a higher form of life, to the enjoyment of eternity in some form. Um, and I did want to react to that real quick. Um, the final ritual elevation to a higher form of life. Like, again, we have to distinguish between the gold-shackled karmic heaven and true liberation. Um, this author, he doesn't really, like, talk about that difference. Uh, again, because he's a cultural anthropologist, not a theologian or um, a scholar or anything like that. Well, that type of scholar, I should say. Um, so I'm going to try and, like, point it out when I can. But, again, like, I'm not... Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to be 100% accurate in pointing out everything that I want to point out in this book. But yeah, um, we'll continue. Most modern Westerners have trouble believing this anymore, which is what makes the fear of death so prominent a part of our psychological makeup. And that kind of touches upon like the failure of copes nowadays. Um, but I've got another slide uh, in a few that breaks it down too. Um, so this is pretty much if if you've heard of this book this is like the quote that's usually pulled um as like an intro for it um what does it mean to be a self-conscious animal the idea is ludicrous if it is not monstrous it means to know that one is food for worms this is the terror to have emerged from nothing to have a name consciousness of self deep inner feelings an excruciating inner yearning or desire <laughs> for life and self-expression, and with all this yet to die. Again, like, anytime you see, like, a yearning or any type of, like, synonym for desire, try to keep in mind the whole, like, karmic um, aspect of, of this. Um, but yeah, it seems like a hoax, which is why one type of cultural man rebels openly against the idea of God. What kind of deity would create such complex and fancy worm food? Cynical deities, said the Greeks, who use man's torments for their own amusements. <laughs> wink, wink. But yeah. Um, so this kind of goes into, like, the hero heroism as, like, the initial cope. Um, so the hero is, like... Um, the foundational, like, ideal... Um, for humans to quote-unquote live a successful life. Or, in their minds, um, to achieve immortality, you would have to do something heroic, basically. Um, which is interesting to think about. You know, why, why, why humans, like, inherently, like, assumed like <laughs> a process like that requires like work or sacrifice or something like that um but yeah so the hero was the man who could go into the spirit world the world of the dead and return alive he had his descendants in the mystery cults of the eastern mediterranean which were cults of death and resurrection the divine hero of each of these cults was one who had come back from the dead Christianity itself was a competitor with the mystery cults and won out, among other reasons, because it too featured a healer with supernatural powers who had risen from the dead. The great triumph of Easter is the joyful shout, Christ has risen, an echo of the same joy that devotees of the mystery cults enacted at their ceremonies of the victory over death. These cults, as G. Stanley Hall so aptly put it, were an attempt to attain an immunity bath from the greatest evil, death and the dread of it. All historical religions address themselves to the same problem of how to bear the end of life. <laughs> religions like Hinduism and Buddhism performed the ingenious trick of pretending not to want to be reborn, which is a sort of negative magic, claiming not to want what you really want most. <laughs> Again, <laughs> 
he's an anthropologist and he's got a different perspective on this. Um, <laughs> it's not pretending not to want to be reborn. It's it's achieving that state of mind that I would say Hinduism and Buddhism really goes after. So yeah. The crisis of modern society is precisely that the youth no longer feel heroic in the plan for action that their culture has set up. They don't believe it is empirically true to the, pop, to the problems of their lives and times. We are living a crisis of heroism that reaches into every aspect of our social life. The dropouts of university heroism, of business and career heroism, of political action heroism... The rise of anti-heroes, those who would be heroic each in his own way, or like Charles Manson with his special family. Those who tormented, those whose tormented heroics slash out of the system that itself has ceased to represent agreed heroism. The great perplexity of our time, the churning of our age, is that the youth have sensed, for better or worse, a great social historical truth. That just as there are useless self-sacrifices and unjust wars, so too is there an ignoble heroics of whole societies. And this pretty much sums up the um, the modern problem of man. Um, um, basically, like like I said, heroism is like the initial cope, and it's a cope like to, to for us to believe that we could be immortal in some way. Um, and nowadays, like, these copes are starting to fail. Like, religion's not really... It's, it's funny because it's like, you know how, um, oh, what's that, what's that bias? Whenever someone believes something is, or whenever someone believes an incorrect thing and you show them evidence that says they're wrong all of a sudden they try to believe it like more more zealously in that same way like like yes you have like the religious people who like cling on to it like harder um and like desperation but like those religious people i would say a lot of them like don't even like truly understand it on a profound level like they want to make themselves believe it like, just on the, like, most basic, like, like I said, Bible Belt, <laughs> um, fundamental Christian, uh, way, um, without having to actually, like, do the work of, like, diving deep into all these topics, um, but yeah, um, I like that other line, those whose tormented heroics lash out at the system that itself has ceased to represent agreed heroism, um, kind of explains all of the, like, civil unrest that we've had in America in the past, like, year. Or really the past, like, well, I mean, this was written in the 70s. This has been ongoing. <laughs> I just think it's really funny that it's, like, still, like, relevant to this day. Um, but, yeah. And then this kind of touches upon Otto Rank's artistic solution. But, um... We'll introduce Kierkegaard's religious solution later. Again, this is just the preface, but yeah. This, after all is said and done, is the only real problem of life, the only worthwhile preoccupation of man. What is one's true talent, his secret gift, his authentic vocation? Um, I just want to say, like, <laughs> people talk about this stuff, and it's like, they they always, like, want to mystify it or whatever, make it seem so much more grandiose than it really is. Um, like, um, I think back to the movie Soul, um, the main guy, Joe, um, where he's like, oh, I, I want to, you know, perform with, with this, like, um, iconic, like, idol of a performer or a musician, and, like, that'll be my, like, my big, like, um, authentic vocation, my secret gift is, like, being able to, um, like, perform at that level, um, where, like, by the end of the movie, he realizes, like, you know, what I was already doing, you know, teaching, uh, children, especially the one that, like, was actually interested in music, like, that's actually a lot more, like, 
fulfilling for him in some way um than like his supposed like desire or dream quote unquote um but yeah i just wanted to point that out like don't (laughs) don't make it so like (laughs) grandiose i just think it's funny but yeah um oh yeah another one uh from that movie was the barber like he wanted to go to college for something else i think he wanted to be like a better vet 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 veterinarian or something but like he ended up going to barber school and joe was like oh i'm i'm so sorry for you man that sucks and he's like what are you talking about like <laughs> this barber stuff like i get i get to meet like cool people like i'm i'm doing like a a service that like utilizes his artistic expression in some way like yeah <laughs> like he was chilling um so yeah just wanted to say that like authentic vocation doesn't have to be something divine well well yeah, grandiose i'll stick with grandiose but yeah um in what way is one truly unique and how can he express this uniqueness give it form dedicate it to something beyond himself now this i want to like pull in the jainistic thought um where it's like yes and no um this or that maybe what not like is it is it are you dedicating to something beyond yourself are you dedicating it to your higher self are you dedicating it to the true god like it's uh, any of these answers could be yes uh, I, I would say could be um but yeah how can the person take his private inner being the great mystery that he feels at the heart of himself his emotions his yearnings ah, careful desires watch out and use them to live more distinctly to enrich both himself and mankind with the peculiar quality of his talent <clears throat> now i would say like okay enriching yourself yes if you're doing it on a spiritual level enriching mankind shouldn't really be an objective i would say it should more so be like um a byproduct of focusing on yourself and on your spiritual path and doing your authentic vocation but yeah that pretty much sums up the entire preface um that's pretty much everything we're going to be going through we touched upon yeah we touched upon a lot of stuff um kind of looked at a preview of like these different um chapters that we're going to be going through uh so yeah hope um hope you're ready for the rest of this the the next video let's see the why we cope it shouldn't be too long um hopefully i can do it within the next week or two um but yeah oh and by the way since uh this was a little late i actually do have a um a little surprise gift a (laughs) trick-or-treat for you um it's it's gonna be an unlisted video but i'm gonna put the link down in the description box so you can check that out um but yeah y'all take it easy see you next time